endemic. I'm quite convinced that one of the reasons the British Army only took American tanks to Italy in 1943 was that the standard of reliability of the British machines they used in the desert, particularly as personified by the Crusader, had really actually put them off. And therefore tanks like the Grant that we've seen and the Sherman which followed it were reliable and therefore far more acceptable to British troops. Despite the limitations of machines like the Crusader, in North Africa the signs were there of the dangerous flaws in Germany's tank capability. In the relative backwater of the Desert War, even the unspectacular British Matilda tank was considered a success against the Italian forces and frequently held its own against the Germans. The gun on the Matilda, which is typical of most tanks of this period, is the two-pounder, a 40 millimeter weapon, but it only fired solid shot. In other words, it was only any use firing against enemy tanks. Now, this was fine under those circumstances, but once the Germans came to the desert and started mixing tanks and anti-tank guns in the attack, you needed a dual-purpose gun, something that not only fired solid shot to take out enemy tanks, but could also fire high explosive shells. And that sort of advantage comes in at last, when we get the American tanks over, notably the General Grant. Once again, superior German battlefield tactics were overcoming the limitations of her armoured forces. But these successes also reinforced a leisurely attitude towards the development of new types. In 1941, the evolution of German tank design was proceeding much too slowly, and it was to have deadly consequences, from which Germany would never recover. The shock was to be delivered in Russia. When Hitler ordered the conquest of Russia in the summer of 1941, confidence among the Panzer Force was at an all-time high. The Desert War was progressing well, and the German tactics of mixing tank and anti-tank forces together concealed the deficiencies in tank design from the Germans themselves. Despite the understandable cockiness of the German high command, a few lessons from earlier campaigns had been absorbed, and the makeup of the tank force which shook Stalin to the core had a much higher proportion of the heavier Mark III and IV tanks, instead of the lightweight Panzer I and IIs. This trend illustrated the steadily increasing reliance on heavier armor, which was to continue throughout the war. It was just as well because the Wehrmacht was about to meet with a very nasty surprise. After a few weeks of the campaign in which the German armor had faced only obsolete Russian tanks, such as the lumbering T-28 and the outdated BT-7, the German forces suddenly encountered two of the new Russian tanks, which were to change the course of the war. The first was the heavy KV-1, a 46-ton monster with superior heavy armor and a vicious 76mm gun capable of destroying any German tank from most ranges on the battlefield. In 1941, it was a deadly adversary. The Soviet KV-1 is a fine example of a tank made for specific conditions. Broad tracks for dealing with mud and snow and a diesel engine for operating in the coldest possible weather. In 1941, when it first appeared, it was a superb design and absolutely dominated the battlefield. But by the time Kursk came, it was beginning to get outclassed. The Tigers and the Panthers, with their thicker armour and enormous guns, could take it out at ranges beyond which it simply couldn't fight back. The other unpleasant surprise for Germans was the arrival of the T-34, a medium tank far better armed and equipped than the German Mark IV. It was also better equipped to deal with the extreme Russian weather conditions. Its wide tracks made it equally at home in the dry, in mud, or in snow. In addition, the sloping armor presented an angled front to German fire, designed to cause shells to glance off the armor. The T-34 was to become the real nemesis of the German army. It was built for mass assembly, and the crude welding lines can be clearly seen. It was no beauty, but it was tough, and it possessed a superb inbuilt ability to be upgraded. 
Now the T-34 was probably one of the finest tank designs of the Second World War. You have for a start one of the first tanks to be fitted with sloped armour, which in defensive terms is excellent. But the great thing about T-34 was the way it was capable of improvement, and I cannot illustrate it any better than by the guns here. When the T-34 first appeared in service, it was fitted with a 76mm gun and had a two-man crew in the turret. By 1944, they had not only upgunned it to take an 85mm weapon, they'd increased the turret size to enable it to take three men, and that makes it a far more efficient tank on the battlefield. Nobody else achieved that throughout the war, and that alone would single the T-34 out as one of the most outstanding tanks of all time. Although the Germans would devise better tanks, they could never hope to compete in terms of the sheer numbers of T-34s. The T-34 was the most prolific tank of the Second World War, and when you consider that the Soviets achieved that and moved their tank producing facilities right across the country under German pressure, it really is remarkable. Just inspect the tank closely and you'll see how crude it is. The workmanship would make the average British or American factory worker weep, but that doesn't worry the Russians at all. They are out to produce as many crude, hard, tough fighting tanks as possible, and in the T-34 they achieved it, no doubt about that at all. It was by no means the best tank to emerge from World War II, but it was more than adequate for the task, and the huge numbers manufactured would ultimately tip the balance of the whole war. It was now almost too late that the German high command began to urgently request new tanks with superior armor and more effective guns to combat the KV-1 and T-34. A new heavy tank was needed urgently, but it wouldn't be available for at least a year. To compound matters, mistaken assessments based on experience in France had led to even the heaviest German tank, the Mark IV, being equipped with short-barreled 75mm guns. While Germany scrambled to produce the new heavy tanks, the Mark IVs were urgently re-equipped with long-barreled 75mm guns. Extra welded steel skirts were also added as a defense against the new Russian hollow-charge weapons. Measures like these helped to keep up the momentum of the German advance in 1942, but the Panzer divisions were increasingly hard-pressed by the growing numbers of T-34s and KV-1s. What the Russians had uh, tried to do was to bring in two new tanks, the T-34, which actually was the tank which had been tested in 39, and the rather heavier tank, uh, the Klimvor Shilov. But they'd only produced uh, about a thousand of each, so therefore these uh, T-34s were, di were, were distributed in very small packets. Uh, and remember, the battlefront is about 2,000 miles long, so what do you do with a thousand tanks? On the other hand, it did come as an enormous shock the first time that the Germans encountered the T-34 because the T-34's armor, mobility, speed, and gunpower was something they simply hadn't suspected. And Guderian, as you will remember, actually, in November 1941, ran into a T-34 ambush and was completely destroyed, the German units. It was then, actually, that the Germans began to realize they were up against something which they had not realized. In the German ranks, it was felt that the deadly 88mm anti-tank gun was the ideal weapon for the task of destroying the hordes of T-34s. But the 88 was originally designed as an anti-aircraft gun. It was very large and not designed to be carried in the turret of a tank. What the Germans now needed was a tank big enough to house such a gun and well armoured enough to withstand the punishment which it would receive on the battlefield. It would take time to develop such a machine, and in 1941, one stopgap measure was to increase the production of assault guns, or turretless tanks. This is a machine called a Sturmgeschütz. It's basically a Panzer III chassis, with the gun fitted into a superstructure rather than the turret. There's two big advantages. One, it's quicker and cheaper to produce, and secondly, you can actually fit a far larger gun than you'd be able to fit into a turret on the same hull. The disadvantage, of course, is that the thing cannot deal in open battle with its enemies like a tank can. It can't swing a turret round to fire, it's got to swing the whole vehicle round. In 1941, the puny 50mm gun was still the standard anti-tank armament for German tanks. 
The experience of tank ace Hermann Bix was typical of the desperate straits many German tank commanders now found themselves in. Bix saw a dozen of his...